crap off. Just saying. It's a wonderful uh, and six says this. Shout with joy to God. We could stop right there. All right. Shout with joy to God on the earth. Glory of his name and make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cry for you. All the earth bows down to you and they sing praise to you. Sing praise to your name. Come and see what God has done. How awesome are his works on behalf of his God is good. I tell you what, people think the last year was all it was the best year we ever had because it was just how mighty our God is. And I am grateful to be here today, and I know you are too. So let's go ahead and open the word of prayer. Father, we are so thankful for your presence in our lives and your presence here in this place. Lord, we turn this day with gratitude and joy in our hearts because you alone are worthy of our praise. You are the one who has sustained us and given us life in the, some really difficult times. And the fact that you, the creator of the heavens and all that is in them, would be interested, aware, and intimately involved with every moment of our lives is just amazing to us. And so we worship you this day. We lift your name up. We glorify you because you alone are worthy of our praise. And Lord, we turn to you this day and we ask that you would continue to bless our lives with your presence. But Lord, there are many who are among us and in the world today that are hurting. We think of those who are dealing with health issues and their uncertainty that's involved with it. And I pray, God, that you would come to them and that you would put your healing hand upon them, bring healing into their lives, perform miracles, we pray, and give them peace. And Lord, we pray that for those who have lost loved ones and are, are struggling with the idea that they're, they're Life is different now, and there's an emptiness, a hole that can't be filled. And so, Lord, we come to you, and we ask that you would come and fill that hole, that you would comfort them as only you can. And we know, Lord, that there are some who are just dealing with financial difficulties, and in this day and age, with everything having been shut down, businesses closing, jobs being lost, and the uncertainty of the future, there are a lot of people who are really struggling right now financially, God. And so we turn to you and look to you to be their provider that you would come alongside of them and meet their need right where they are. And for those who are struggling with uh, family relationship issues, God, we, we ask that you would come into their, into their homes, into their hearts, into their relationships and bring healing and joy and peace. And, and, and we ask, oh God, that you would strengthen our families. And we ask that you would be with our church and all the other churches in our community and across the world but we're not ashamed to say that we rely on you for everything. You have never, ever let us down. Faithfulness endures throughout all generations. And so we turn to you this day and we say, oh God, we are yours. We ask that you would move in your power and your might with your Holy Spirit, that you would energize this church and be, that we would be a beacon of light in our community. That we would somehow be able to share the love of Jesus Christ with people who desperately need to hear it. And may we be the ones, O oh God, that you use to start a revival. And so we offer ourselves to you in this service, just to let you know that we love you, that we rely upon you. We, we are so grateful for your direction and how you work your will in our lives. But we turn to you this day, Lord, and we say we want to hear from heaven once again. We want to hear your word today. We want to be drawn closer to you. And so as we continue with this service, Lord, we ask that you would be strong and that your presence would overwhelm us and that your spirit would just flood our hearts and our souls and our minds with the truth and the love and the grace and the mercy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name we ask all of these things. Amen. Well, we're going to go ahead and... I'm not going to tell anybody. And I invite everyone to join us as we worship together.
Forgot my uh, my to do list. <laughs> Just a word about the offering. If you brought an offering with you today, there's an offering plate in the back, and you can go ahead and drop it in there. If you're at home, the address is there on your screen. P.O. Box eight forty three, Mount Sterling, Kentucky four zero three five three. We try to make it as easy as we can for you to remain faithful to God, and boy, have you been faithful, and we're grateful for that. Um, and another thing is that we are doing online Bible studies uh, every Sunday night and every Wednesday night. Um, Sunday nights we're doing the big and the not so big stories of the Bible. Tonight we'll be talking about the story of Judas. It's a story that's kind of hard to hear, but there's a lot to learn from it. And so tonight I invite you to tune in on Facebook Live at 6 o'clock and we'll be talking about Judas and, and his whole mess of a life. <laughs> and uh, and then Wednesdays at 6.30, we're going through the book of Ephesians, and I invite you to join, to join us with that. It's always a good time. People are calling me all the time and texting me and saying how much it means to them, and I'm like going, well, uh, it's kind of hard for me to process that. Uh, it must be God doing some really good things with that. And our youth are meeting at 6.30 on Wednesday nights, too. Rambunctious is always and full of life and energy, and I tell you what, it's a beautiful thing to hear our youth filling the halls with laughter and learning about Jesus, and it's just a great thing. So, Well, all right, let's hear it. Here we go. I am, like most people, uncomfortable receiving a gift of service from somebody else, especially if it's something that I am perfectly capable of doing for myself. You know what I'm talking about? You know, where somebody says, hey, I want to wash your windows for me. I can wash my windows, and I'm uncomfortable receiving that gift of service. And I suspect that most of us feel the same way. A couple years ago, uh, we went on a mini vacation down to Gatlinburg. And we took Jill and one of her friends from school, and we went down. It was just a, it was just a weekend kind of a thing, but Leah and I decided we were going to knock off a couple of things that we've always wanted to do down there that we never had a chance to do. We went whitewater rafting. It was great. Jill fell in the water. We all laughed. Not at Jill. We laughed at Leah. The, the guide, before we even, we're sitting in the raft, and he's telling us all the rules about what you do. And he said, if somebody falls out, don't leave your seat on the boat. We will navigate over to them and pull them back in. They have the life vest on. And so, and so as soon as Jill fell out into the water, Leah went into mama bear mode and literally jumped across the boat. And our guide back there um, is saying, ma'am, 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 and I finally had to grab a hold of her. Leah, get back in your seat. We're going to get her. It's okay. So we went whitewater rafting. That was fun. It was a, that was a blast. But we also went zip lining. You ever done that? Okay, let me, let me explain to you a little bit about zip lining if you've never done it. They put a little harness on you that hooks to a big cable, and on the cable has got this little pulley system. Not, well, they got like little wheels on there, and you start on one tree, and you're 100 feet up in the air, and you zip a couple hundred feet down, 
at speeds that are like mind bending, you know, time changes when you do this and, and then you stop at the other one, you land over there and then they hook you up to another line that takes you to another tree and you go all the way. It, it's a blast. It's a lot of fun. On this particular zip line course that we were on, there was one where we went almost a quarter of a mile and we were reaching speeds of like 30 or 40 miles an hour, and we were going over a ravine that was 125 feet down. It was just incredible. It was so much fun. We had, I mean, it's a blast. But while we were in the place, before we you know, went up to the first tree, they are going through all the instructions. I'm a guy. Instructions don't mean a whole lot to me. And, and so they're going through the instructions, how to put the harness on and everything else like that. Now, I'm the kind of guy that's like this. I will stand back if it's something new, and I will watch what they do with everybody else, and I go, okay, I can do that. That's fine. And so I will do it myself. It does two things. It makes me look good in the eyes of everybody else, like, oh, he must know what he's doing. Sometimes that works in your favor. Sometimes not so much, but, but that's another thing altogether. And the other thing it does, it makes me feel pretty proud of myself. I figured this out all by myself. Until the girl that came, it was our guide, came along and, and pointed out that there was a cinch strap, a cinch strap, a cinch as in, pulling things tightly so that the harness doesn't fall off. I had, um, well, I hadn't hooked it up properly, and that if I had gone up on the line and zipped at 120 miles an hour over a 13,000-foot ravine, it would have been, well, let's just say, slightly uncomfortable. You see, I didn't see that part when she was doing, and so she helped me correct that in front of everyone. It was highly embarrassing for me. I was humbled by it, but also at the same time kind of grateful because I didn't want to go through all of those zip lines being cinched uncomfortably, if you catch my meaning. So anyhow, we went on the zip line. It was awesome, and everything was great, and, uh, and, and as we were coming off of that, I began to think to myself, oh, my foolish pride. Yeah. And every guy here and every guy listening to us right now, you know what I'm talking about because we've all done it. And most of you women have done it too. Oh, my foolish pride. Yours too. Well, we try to say, you know what? I've got this. I can take care of this on my own. I, 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 I don't need anybody's help. I can just do this by my own. Oh, it's that pride that just gets us into trouble sometimes, doesn't it? And Jesus has uh, something to say and to show us in our passage this morning uh, about pride and humility. And so if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to John chapter 13. We're going to start reading there in verse number 1. And as you're doing that, just to, I'll give you a little background. We're doing a, a sermon series leading right up to Easter. And we started with Jesus declaring that he's the bread of life and that we, too, are to carry the bread of life to the world around us that is hungry and thirsty for him. And then we learned about how he is the light of the world and we are to carry his light into a dark world so they can see Jesus. And then, you know, we talked about how, how God is the good shepherd and how he leads us to where we need to be and he protects us and all of those things and that we are to also offer that protection to the people who are vulnerable in our world and today we're talking about humility, how Jesus literally models for us what he expects out of each and every one of us. So here we are in John chapter 13, starting in verse number 17, or verse number 1, sorry. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. And here we go. It was just before the Passover festival, and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. And the evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later on you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. Then Lord Simon replied, then not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus said, well, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you were clean, though not every one of you, because he knew who was going to betray him. 
And that was why he said, not every one of them. And when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. And do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. If you're anything like me, you find yourself wondering, why is washing the disciples' feet such a big deal? Why is this so important? You know, I get the whole humble servant thing. I mean, you know, most all of us do. When we read the story, we go, oh, that makes sense. But why is it so important? There's got to be more to the story than what we've just simply read right here. I mean, foot washing was a very common thing in the first century Israel. It was used for ritual cleansing. You washed your hands before you ate, and like we do today, you washed your hands and your feet before you went into the Sabbath to enter the temple. It was very important to their culture and their lifestyle. And it was also a, a, a way for you to show hospitality. If you had a visitor come into your house, well, there were a couple of things. They had sandals, and they did not have paved roads. Dirty roads equal dirty feet. And you don't want to bring dirty feet into their house, and so they made this available. You could go and get your feet washed there. And, and most people who were hosting people in would provide a slave who would do that for them. They would go and wash their feet so they came in and they could enjoy the hospitality together. But even with this, we don't fully grasp what Jesus is doing here. We don't grasp the meaning of this story. There is a lot more going on here than just simply giving people clean feet before a meal. You know, it, foot washing was not one of those jobs that you aspired to do. It was not something that you said, you know what, I'm going to study to be a foot washer. It was a menial task. It was a task that was given to those who were the lowest of the totem pole in the household. And it was often done by a servant, most likely a Greek or a Gentile servant, in the, in the prosperous homes of Israel of that day. So not even Jewish slaves were awarded this job to do. It was always done by a Gentile. So what about what happened in that room with Jesus? And we're starting to try to build these building blocks a little bit to find out what was really going on here. But there are some things going on here that really should blow all of our minds together. What happened in that room? What was so important? Well, first of all, at that last supper that, where this took place, the, the wine and the bread simply point to the fact that Jesus is going to offer himself up as a sacrifice for all of us. It points to his death and his resurrection. And so we have to look at this foot washing in that perspective. So what do we do with that? Well, it means that Jesus is using this, this scene, this action, as a way of describing and showing and demonstrating for us what it means to be a member of his kingdom. This humble act of washing their feet needs to be understood in light of his sacrifice. And it's something only Jesus could have done. Nobody else could do this and have it be as meaningful as he did. It was the ultimate form of service, and his disciples knew it. Anybody who knew anything about anything during that day would have realized, wait a second, this guy is our teacher. He is our leader. This guy is important. I mean, he is a healer. He is, I mean, he's got like rock star status. Everywhere he goes, the people flock because they want to hear his words. They want to see him perform miracles. And he's the one washing our feet. And right there, we see automatically, we see right out of the gate, something's different here. Something's going on that's, that's just we need to pay attention to. But what made this so powerful is not the act itself. The act of washing the feet, that's not what we should be focusing on. A lot of people look at this service, at, at this foot washing thing, and say, oh, he humbled himself to wash their feet. But that's not what's important here. What's really important here is that Jesus himself is the one who assumed the role to perform the act. 
Jesus is the one who says, I am going to humble myself and wash your feet. Now, who is Jesus? Well, he is God's son. He is the Messiah. He is the chosen one, the anointed one, the one who has come into the world for one specific purpose, and that is to provide salvation for everybody so that we could be reconciled to God. If there was ever a most important that ever walked on the face of the earth, it's Jesus. King of kings and Lord of lords, washing feet. And it's astonishing to us. And it should humble us. And it should cause us to think a couple of things about this. It should cause us to look at what Paul says in chapter 2 of Philippians, where he says that Jesus, being in the very form of God, in the very nature of God, having all of his godness with him, decides to take that godness and set it aside and come to earth as a human being. Not just any human being, but a baby, a vulnerable baby, and was dependent upon others for everything in his life. And, and that he grew up and became a slave, that he would allow himself to suffer and to die, and then God would raise him up. We're talking about this. This is the same Jesus we're talking about. And that when God raised him up, that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's who we're talking about here. So when we see Jesus washing feet, we should be looking at that verse, that passage, and saying, oh my goodness, this is God himself washing feet. The disciples feet and that puts this in a whole different plane than just simply bending down and humbling yourself to wash feet doesn't it this is the creator of the universe this is the God who knows you and I and everything about our lives this is the one who knows the deepest thoughts we have the, the deepest desires of our heart this is the one who heals our diseases this is the one who provides our needs this is the one who is ultimate wisdom for all mankind for all time both now and forevermore this is the one and he is washing feet he is washing their feet. This was God taking the form of a Gentile slave. And it was an act of pure love. It was a gift that was full of salvation. And this is what we learn from it. The first thing we think and we learn about this is that humble service is highly valued in God's kingdom. I mean, if Jesus does it, then it's a pretty good idea that we should be doing it too. I'm just saying. Humble service is one of those values in God's kingdom that he says, you know what, this one is really, really, really important. If you're going to put a top ten list, this has got to be one, two, or three. Plain and simple. Because Jesus is the one who's doing it. He is doing more than just saying, hey, you need to be humble. He's doing more than just giving words and teaching. He is actually modeling it so that everyone can see it. And that tells us that this is really, really important. That tells us that this value of humility is so very important in God's kingdom. And what I find interesting here is that we very rarely go through this passage and we look at this one word. There's one word in here that just knocked me off my feet this week. He said, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his feet, in his control, in his hands. He knew it. And we mentioned this a little bit last week, but this is part of the plan. From the start of, of the beginning of time. God had said, we need to bring salvation into the world. This is exactly how we're going to do it. We're going to raise up Israel. They're going to be a light to all the nations. Ah, they didn't work out so well. So we're going to send the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus, my own son. We're going to send him into the world. He's going to do for Israel what they couldn't do for themselves. And he is going to be the light into all of the world. It was the plan. And so they're checking off the boxes. They're looking at the schedule. Okay, on this day, this is what's happening. This day, this is what's happening. Jesus wasn't surprised by his death. That's what I'm saying. He wasn't surprised by it in the least. It was supposed to happen, and he knew it. He knew everything had been given to him, put into his hands and into his feet, and he gets up and washes their feet. He knew it, so he got up and washed their feet. If that's not a kingdom value, then nothing is. Jesus, Master, Lord, Teacher, according to what they're saying here, and yet he humbled himself to take the dust off of their feet so they could eat a meal together. 
it was a real teaching moment. It was one of those moments where if you're there and if you're reading it now and we can try to visualize ourselves being in the room with him, we just kind of go, oh, I should learn from this. It's a real teaching moment. Jesus modeled the ultimate kingdom value of becoming less ourselves to lift others up. That's what it all boils down to. To make ourselves less so that others can become more. Second thing I see in this passage is this, is that our pride often gets in the way of living like Jesus. Once again, we look to Peter as our example for how not to do things. In verse 7, he goes, you will not wash my feet. Now, in my text, it doesn't have an exclamation point. But when you look at the life of Peter and all the things that he's done, you've got to say, you know what, he's putting an exclamation point on that. He's like, Jesus, no way are you touching my feet because you are way too much for me. You are, you are too far above me. I am not worthy of it, so don't even come close. I will take care of my feet on my own. You are not going to wash my feet. You know what that does? When we deny a gift of service from somebody, when we say, no, I don't need that from you, you know what happens? We put ourselves in a position of superiority over them by rejecting their offer of love. We actually become the master. Peter, by saying to Jesus, you are not going to wash my feet, is literally telling Jesus what Jesus can and cannot do. Do you see what I'm saying? So anytime somebody comes to us with this idea that they want to serve us out of love and gratitude and that they want to do something for us and we say, you are not going to do that for me, we are literally taking a position that's higher than them and just squashing it down like a bug. And our pride is at the source of it all. And it is that pride that keeps us from living like Jesus both on the receiving end and on the giving end. It puts us in a position of master and not the servant. And what Jesus is demonstrating and modeling for us here is that we're supposed to be the servant. Because the Son of Man did not come into the world to be served, but to serve. That's what Jesus himself said. Pride says, no, I'm the one that's in charge here. I'm the one who's in charge of my harness. I got it down. I don't need your help. Oh. It happens, doesn't it? To all of us. And we're all called to serve. There's no getting around it. We're all called to serve, some way, somehow. If we claim to be followers of Jesus, but don't offer ourselves in service to him, then we got a problem. Because we are supposed to follow Jesus wherever he goes, to do what he does, to say what he says. We are to be imitators of his life. And if Jesus is serving others, well, we better do it too. He washed the disciples' feet. He healed the sick. He fed the poor. He set captives free. And I could go on and on and on. He did all of these things. He was the ultimate servant, and it tells us that if we are to be with him, then we need to pick up our cross and follow him. Even at the point of a basin and a towel and somebody's dirty, dusty feet. In fact, when he was pressed about which was the greatest commandment that we could have, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these things. So how do you love your neighbor as yourself? Well, first of all, the best way to start is to serve them. It just makes sense, doesn't it? And what happens when we do this? Well, Jesus said if we follow his example and do it, then we'll be blessed. It's, it's pretty cut and dry. I'm not saying anything profound or spectacular here today. This is right there, and anybody can see it and understand it because this is what God says that we're supposed to be doing. God calls us to live our lives like Jesus. Now, he doesn't call us to do the healing and all that other stuff. He understands we're just human, but we're supposed to follow his example in our everyday walking around lives, wherever we find ourselves, grocery store, gas station, at our work, with our friends, at our family outings, wherever we may find ourselves. We're supposed to live like Jesus did. We are called to a life of self-giving love, humility, 
sacrificing our own successes so that others are lifted up. We don't have to hang on our own achievements or our own abilities for the world to see Jesus in us. We have to let go of those things so that the world can see Jesus in us. The Christian life is all about lifting up the people around you. Everywhere you go. I mean, if you want a good place to start, right there in your own home. If you've got another person living in your house with you, well, there's a good place to start. Serve them, out of love. And don't expect anything out of return. Just do it. And you're being Jesus to them. It's that simple. It's about honoring each other. It's about loving people in your orbit just as Jesus loves them. I mean, he knows that many of the people in your, in your life are unlovable. He gets it. I mean, and it's okay for us to admit that. There are people that we know that are unlovable, hard to love, and yet we're called to serve them nonetheless. And we can only do that in the power of God's Spirit as he's poured himself into us. But we can do it, and we're supposed to do it. He knows that many of the people in your life are difficult and hateful and generally a pain in the neck. He knows that. He's, he loves them anyway. So, you love them anyway. This is the way of Jesus. This is how he taught us to live. This is every, all the gospel. This is it right here. He wasn't into condemning people because they didn't dress right or talk right. He didn't tell people that they weren't accepted because they didn't fit in didn't belong to the right church? No, not even close. He was actively going out, finding those very people and saying, hey, i got a place for you to belong right here. And that's how we should be too. It doesn't matter what people dress like or look like or act like or talk like. If they want to meet Jesus, this ought to be a place where they can come and meet Jesus. You know, no questions asked. Just say, well, I'm glad you're here. How can I serve you? And by doing that, we demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ in their lives. And it transforms people all the time. When we look at life of Jesus in the Gospels, we see him going to the people that the church would absolutely avoid. We see him extending mercy to the lepers, forgiveness to the, the people who are caught up in adultery. We see him exalting children and patiently teaching 12 guys that had a hard time figuring out what this whole thing was all about we see Jesus pouring himself out on behalf of others out of love. This is the way of Jesus. And he has given us the example for how we should live. And it's up to us to learn from him and put it into practice. So, ask yourself this question. I dare you. Because it's not an easy question. I double-dog dare you. How can I be Jesus in my world today? Now, go and do it. Will you stand with me as we pray? Father, we are grateful for this reminder once again of how we are supposed to take seriously the life of Jesus and to follow him wherever he went and do the things that he asked us to do. And Lord, this humility thing is a really difficult thing for us. We, we, we don't do this very well. We're, we're grateful. We don't like accepting things from others when we can do it for ourselves and we, we think we know better and all that stuff. That Lord, would you do us a favor and just kind of put a stick of dynamite underneath that and blow it out of our lives? Lord, we need to learn how to be more humble before you. I need to learn how to be more humble before you. And so we ask that you would take this word that you've given us this day and that you would cement it into our hearts and our minds, that you would teach us and keep on teaching us and help us to learn so that it becomes second nature for every one of us to go out and serve the people in our world who desperately need to know who you are. And if we can do that, then it's enough because we know that you'll take care of the rest. So go with us, we pray. And as we go about our work and our living in this world that we inhabit, we ask, oh God, that you would give us opportunities to serve someone so that Jesus is lifted high and exalted. And for all of this, we say thank you. 
and offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our Master, our model. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his face towards you, be gracious to you. And may the Lord fill you with opportunities after opportunities to serve the people around you with his love this week so that they can see him in you. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And how do we go out into the Lord, leave the house of the Lord today? With great joy. Have a wonderful week, everybody. And join us tonight at 6 o'clock online. Hear a little bit about Judas.